Well, we've, we've made it through Genesis, so you guys can do a little dance and jig. Um, we're just going to go right on into Exodus. We're going to dedicate the rest of the month to Exodus. Did everyone get a, a handout? Hopefully, look, there's, there's some right up here. We're going to make you walk the aisle and come on up here. And, <laughs> and that looks real familiar. And, and John, don't worry if there's not enough room. There are lines on the back. You can, you can write on the back. But hopefully that looks pretty similar. We're going to attack every book of the Bible more or less the same way. We have a few very general statements at the beginning and then just how the book outlines itself, how it fleshes itself out. So, what's the first thing on that list? Author. Who's the author? Moses. Well, yes. God. Wow. Sunday school answer. Thank you, Mike. God wrote it. Yes. That this is true. This is true. But the human author is Moses. Just like Genesis, Exodus is also written by Moses. But who's he writing to? Israel. But when? Now, because throughout that whole period, we have two different generations being spoken to, right? Throughout the wilderness wanderings, the dying off of the rebellious generation, and then the generation that's actually going to enter into the land and take conquest. So which generation is he writing to? Would you reckon? That first generation, this is probably written before the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea. So this is that, that first generation. But what's its purpose? What is the purpose of the book of Exodus? Every word in Scripture has a purpose. Every book has a purpose in line. And we don't really think about this too often. But what's the purpose of the book of Exodus? Would you reckon? That's a big part of it. I mean, there, there is history here. I'm going to read a big, long statement, and I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of it. So you just listen to the long one and then try to copy down the abbreviated one. The purpose of the book of Exodus is to explain how the God of creation, promise, and the patriarchs redeemed Israel from bondage in Egypt and made them his special priesthood to the world through a covenant at Sinai. That's a mouthful. Now, I want to break that down a little bit, just kind of keep the important parts. The purpose of the book of Exodus is to explain how the God of Genesis, you know, creation, promise, and the patriarchs, the God of Genesis, the one that he just wrote about in Genesis, redeemed Israel from, from bondage to be his nation of priests. The book of Exodus... What do you suppose the highlight of the book of Exodus is? Kind of the defining moment. In Genesis, we might say, you know, the Abrahamic covenant, that height that Abraham rose to is almost that tip of the iceberg sort of thing. What do you suppose the, the pinnacle moment in the book of Exodus is? How about the Exodus? Now, that's what we would, we would think, right? How many chapters are in Exodus? 40. The Egyptians are dead at the end of 14. What's the rest of the book about? The pinnacle moment is the covenant at Sinai. This is when a ragtag bunch of slaves become a nation with God at their head. The implementation of the covenant at Sinai is the crowning moment in the book of Exodus. Everything points toward that. Now, we have there a key word and a key verse. What would you, if you could wrap Exodus up in a single word, we're going to use redemption. This is a book about redemption. We go from a nation in servitude, in slavery, and yet they are redeemed to be a nation of priests, a holy nation. This book is about redemption and God being the redeemer in that. What about a verse? And I, I'm cheating. There's actually three verses, but they're in a row. 
You have the answer there? All right. You have, you have several to choose from. Exodus 34, 6 through 8. And this is, we're going to be building up to this point as we work our way through this book. But you can just jot that reference down. But man, if there is a collection of verses that you need to memorize, not just for Exodus, but just for daily Christian living, those verses are it. And we'll get to that point. We'll get to that point. Oh, good. Rex is here. All right. So we have the author, we have the audience, we have the purpose. And then look at that outline. That outline is really around geography. Where are they at? We have a section in Egypt. We have a section on the road when they leave Egypt on their way to Sinai. And the rest of the book takes place at Sinai. And that's just how we're going to break the book down. Just a nice, easy way that we can kind of wrap our arms around and we can study what's going on. So that's going to be our outline, three-point outline. Israel in Egypt. Israel on the road to Sinai. And Israel at Sinai. Those are our three big bullet points there. And I forgot that I actually left those places blank, so I'll give you time to catch up with that. Cindy was looking like, wait, what? Trying to, trying to write all that down. All right, so we begin with Israel in Egypt. And why are they in Egypt in the first place? Why aren't they in Canaan? Sure. I mean, yes, God is going to build a nation from them there. But where did we leave them at the end of Genesis? Jacob and his sons, they all came down to Egypt, and Joseph is basically the prime minister, right? Verses 1 through 6 of chapter 1 of Exodus is a genealogy, more or less. This is the bridge that ties us back to Genesis. We're just going to fast forward a little bit. Now, how do we get this nation whose blood kin is the second most powerful man in the nation how do we get from there to them being in servitude? Well, first, it took a famine, so basically, yes. Sure. But, but I mean, Joseph actually was sold into slavery, and so he was put in, but he ended up being put in a position of authority and power. Right. And so, why are his kinsmen now slaves in Egypt? How do we get from there? Verse 8. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of history there that we need to go over. We're not going to do that tonight. We'll do that next week. But Moses just puts that in there to let you know the political situation has changed dramatically. There is now a new boss in town who does not know nor does he care anything about Joseph. Therefore, he just views all these foreigners as a threat. We need to get a handle on these, right? We're setting the scene for a certain someone to come about. Who's the main character of Exodus? Moses. And I like Moses. I like Moses a lot. Um, you know, we all have maybe our favorite books. We might all have our, our favorite character. Exodus is one of my absolute favorite books of the Bible, and Moses is one of my absolute favorite characters in the entire Bible. Who else has spoken to God as a man speaks to his friend? Moses is awesome, but Moses, we get to see him warts and all, right? Why'd he leave Egypt? He's a murderer. I'm not sure I'd let him date my daughter, but anyways, I just want to look really quickly at the birth of Moses. Chapter 2, right? What does... This account remind us of. There is a king killing all sorts of baby boys, and one escapes, this one whom God has a particular eye on. What is that reminiscent of? Do you think maybe when Matthew wrote his gospel, he was trying to prove that point? Absolutely. There's some similarities there. There's absolutely some similarities there. But he grows up. He's a prince in Egypt. He 
has that unfortunate incident where he kills that Egyptian and now he has to flee. And so he goes over to Midian, he gets married, he turns into a shepherd, he's a herdsman, and then God comes knocking. Go ahead and look at chapter 3. This, this is the burning bush incident. And look what God actually tells him in verse 8. This is God speaking, and he says, So I have come down to deliver from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Why is he mentioning all of those other peoples? Why can't he just say, I'm going to take them up to the land of Canaan? Why do you think? Do you happen to recall? Exactly. Do you happen to recall back in Genesis 15 when God made covenant with Abraham and he said, I'm going to give you all this land, but it's going to be about 400 years. Why is it going to be about 400 years? Because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Absolutely. God's saying, time's up. It's time. You're going to move in, and all these people, you're going to not just displace, but you're going to be instruments of my judgment upon them. Time's up. This is not just a call to Moses to get, get the ball rolling, but this is a God's time clock, God's timetable, which is really interesting because from this moment... How long was it before they actually entered the land? Remember how long they wandered in the wilderness? Forty years. They spent at least a year at Sinai. Not sure how long from this moment to the point they actually came up out of Egypt. Might have been a year or two by the time we figure in all the travel. Do you think maybe you have a sovereign God in control of all this? He knew all of this was going to happen, and he got the ball rolling at precisely the right moment, at precisely the right time. It's not like the Amorites got a 40-year reprieve because Israel fouled up. This happened exactly in God's timetable. But anyways, we want to do an overview, not just get bogged down. So, Moses is commissioned to be God's mouthpiece. He's commissioned to go before Pharaoh and demand what? Come on, you guys have seen Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, right? Let my people go, right? Let my people go that they may serve me. I want you to turn to chapter 5. This is Moses in the presence of Pharaoh. I'm going to start reading in verse 1, and I want you to pay very close attention. And afterwards, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, look at the word Lord in your Bibles. How is it printed? All caps. caps. What does that mean? Okay, let's just substitute that in there. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. And what is Pharaoh's response? Verse 2, But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. And besides, I will not let Israel go. Who is this that you speak of? I have never heard of him. Not interested. The entire scenario of the plagues is Yahweh introducing himself to Pharaoh. Now, what's the first plague? The Nile turns to blood, right? Understand that these are not just arbitrary pronouncements of judgment. They are very precise and very purposeful. Next week when we have time to slow down, we're going to go through each and every one of these. 
Why did the Nile turn to blood? Didn't they worship the Nile? The Egyptians yes. So it was basically, a, uh, I don't know, in my thinking or whatever, it was, it was God pronouncing judgment on something that they worshipped. Sure, but why not just dry the Nile up? Like you said, they worship the Nile. The Nile was an embodiment of a god in their pantheon. They had many gods. Why turn to blood? But why not just dry it up? If you wanted just to take the water away from them, why not just dry it up? Why turn it to blood? Turn it to grape jelly. You can't water crops with that. Well, you couldn't deny it was God if it turned it to grape jelly either. He was making a point. I killed your God. Your God's dead. Every last one of these plagues, he is picking a certain deity from their pantheon and saying they're worthless. They're worthless. And we'll, we can go through that in more detail in times to come, but that is the point of all ten plagues. I am Yahweh, and your God's are useless. I killed them, essentially, if they actually existed. But anyways, that's, that's the ten plagues. This is God, this is Yahweh, introducing himself to Pharaoh. Now, what's the last plague? The firstborn, right? And that inter, interacts with the Passover. What kept Israel safe? Think carefully on this. Was there anything particularly special about the blood on the doorpost? Now, there's many parallels there, and the Bible uses that same language. But let's think very carefully, very critically, and very theologically. It was not anything particularly special about the blood, but they were given very specific instructions, right? Faith demonstrated by obedience. Faith in what God said would happen is what saved them. I'm going to do this, and I want you to do this. And they said, okay. Faith demonstrated by obedience is what saved Israel that day. It is never the things we do. It is faith that saves us. Our faith is demonstrated by works. That's the whole point of James, right? Point and parcel. I just don't want us to become super legalistic. You know, there's something mysterious that's happening on here. There's a lot of imagery that's going on here that the Lord is going to use later in Revelation. But there's nothing particularly redemptive about lamb's blood, which is... Unfortunate, because then we can just shoot all the sheep and it'd be all great. But anyways, this gets us through that first bullet point. Because now they're coming out. They are no longer in Egypt. And how do they come out? Well, not, we're not quite there. Not quite there. How do they come out? Because I have a few things to say on the actual destruction of, of Pharaoh and all that. But... Yeah, they do. Just like who? Who came out of... Yeah, back in Genesis 12, who came out of Egypt wealthy, bestowing gifts on him to get him out? Same thing going on, but on a much, much larger scale. The Egyptians are coming out in droves and giving them whatever they can to get Israel out of here. We don't want your God here. Your God hurts. So now they have, and really as we look at a good, a good chunk of this book is very detailed descriptions on how to build what? The tabernacle. Filled with many precious 
and expensive materials? Where did a bunch of slaves get all that? God provided at the Exodus. Anyways, but Pharaoh has a change of heart, right? He wants to round them up and kill them all. Go ahead and turn to Exodus 14. If you are someone who highlights in your Bible, you need to reserve a very specific color. In my Bible, I used purple. It doesn't matter what color it is. But every time you see the phrase, so that they will know I am Yahweh, after every single one of these plagues, that's what God says. Why is God going to destroy Pharaoh and his entire army? Wasn't the point made? Couldn't he just keep them back a little bit? Let Israel cross on dry land? 14 verse 4, Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. God orchestrated this entire event so that the nation of Egypt would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, like, oh, you don't know who Yahweh is? Well, now you do. And I will be honored. I will not be blasphemed even among the heathen. I am Yahweh. That's what it means, right? That's what the name means. I am who I am. So the Egyptians come through, God kills them all. And chapter 15 is a psalm. It's a song that Moses wrote and taught the nation of Israel. There's a lot of theology here. There's a lot of really fantastic stuff. We're not going to get into it tonight. We'll get into that when we go through it with our, with our small groups. You want me to sing it to us? In the, in the original Hebrew as well, right? <laughs> I don't think so, John. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, just a second. Let me look at my notes here. Yeah, you distracted me. There is one interesting, there is one thing that I wanted to read. Right before, Pharaoh and his army, they're coming down. Israel is literally trapped between a rock and a hard place, and the people start to panic, right? What does Moses tell them? Look at verse 13, chapter 14, verse 13. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see them again. Yahweh will fight for you while you keep silent. Salvation is of the Lord. He is the worker. He's the mover. He's the shaker. You just trust him and you stand by and you keep your mouth shut and watch what God is capable of doing. There's a lot of implications with that. A lot of implications with that. Now, starting in 15 and 16, we see God providing for Israel in in many ways. There's several instances of him getting water for them, purifying the the bitter streams to uh, provide manna for them, to provide meat for them. And what phrase do we see pop up? Look at chapter 15, verse 26. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandment and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on which I put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Israel was not a Yahweh-worshiping nation. In Egypt, they weren't. 
they were idolaters. They were just as pagan as the Egyptians. And that will show itself to be true the more we get through the books of Moses. God just spent a lot of time introducing himself to the pagan Egyptians. And now he's introducing himself to his own people. Look at 16 verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Egypt. Look at 16 verse 12. This is God speaking. I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel to them saying at twilight I will eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. Same language that he used of the Egyptians, he is now using of Israel. It's like, we need to get acquainted. You will know that I am Yahweh, your God. And this is how it is the entire trip to Sinai. Now, how many chapters did we say are in Exodus? 40, right? We're almost halfway through, and we've already covered everything that any Sunday school lesson ever teaches on the whole book of Exodus, right? Like once they get them out of Egypt, it's just, I guess we're done. The crowning moment is Sinai itself. Chapters 19 through 40, half of the book takes place at Sinai. Takes place at Sinai. In chapter 19, Moses goes up. And what is he functioning as? He's really their leader, right? What would we call that? A mediator, a go-between? What's a more official title for someone like that? I'm sorry? Priest. Priest. Moses is both leader and priest. That's interesting. It's going to be very interesting when we get to the book of Deuteronomy and he prophesies that there will be one who comes like him. But now, what tribe is Moses from? Levi. So if we've been paying a lick of attention through Genesis, we know that he's not the one, right? But we've already kind of gotten used to not finding the one. We're trying to find a line. But this one, even though he's not the one, he's from the wrong tribe. He's not from the tribe of Judah. But he's setting some precedences. He's definitely setting some precedences. He is both leader and priest. So he goes up, and then in 19, verse 8, Yahweh comes down. If there's anything we're going to learn in the book of Exodus, it is what it means to have a holy God. We need to learn what the fear of the Lord is. Listen to this description. Now, Mount Sinai, I'm starting in verse 18, chapter 19. Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to Yahweh to gaze, and many of them perish. And also let the priests who come near to Yahweh consecrate themselves, lest Yahweh break out against them. They break that border, I'm going to kill them. They are common, I am holy. They will not desecrate me. Chapter 20 is the beginning of the Ten Commandments, right? What are the Ten Commandments? Who can name them? Spot check. There will be no other gods. You will not have any idols. You will not take the name of the Lord in vain. You will remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet.
Why those? Why that particular order? The first have to deal with our relationship with God. Absolutely. Then the next deal with our relationship with each other. And I think that's a good starting point. The first four deal vertically with our relationship with God. And five through ten deal with our relationships with each other. Now, I want to build on that just a little bit. The first four is what it means to have a holy God. This isn't just, hey, if you want a right relationship with Jesus, this is what you do. This is, you need to understand what it means to have a holy God. You will not have any other. He is the one. You will not make an idol of another God, or even a representation of him. He cannot be described. He is infinite. You try to compare him to anything, you automatically diminish him. That's what it means to make an idol. We want to say that God is strong and fierce like a bear, so we make an idol of a bear. Are you kidding me? He's so much more than that. You cannot capture him. He is beyond description. You will not take his name in vain. You will not associate him with sin. When he places, do you, want, do you really want to know what it means to take the name of the Lord your God in vain? It's much more than just swearing. As a believer, as a New Testament believer, you have his name on you. It is as if your last name is Christian, right? You entangle yourself with sin. You are now combining sin with the name of the Lord. Every time you sin, you take the name of the Lord your God in vain and treat it as light, treat it as nothing. Tell me that don't bring conviction. This is what it means to have a holy God. Now, 5 through 10 Well, what does this look like in our day-to-day life? How do we live in light of having a holy God? Well, honor your father and mother because God put them there, right? Do not commit adultery because God created marriage. He designed this. You break that, you are considering your God as light. This is what it means to live and interact with other people having a holy God. So yes, one set deals with the vertical, one set deals with the horizontal, but the implications are a little bit deeper than that. They are focused in a different direction, but they are intrinsically tied together. This is what it means to have a holy God. And that is... Essentially, the Ten Commandments. Now, moving on, because I'm getting hungry. Verses 21 through 23 is God's covenant with Israel, God's contract with Israel. This is what life is going to look like. If you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God, this is what life is going to look like. In verse 24, I'm sorry, verse 24, chapter 24, God meets with the elders, God meets with Moses, and this is, this is interesting. Look at verse 11 of chapter 24. Yet he, that is God, did not stretch out his hands against the nobles or the sons of Israel, And they beheld God, and they ate and drank. What is God going to tell Moses in chapter 33 when he says, show me your glory? No man can see my glory and live. How do we rectify this? They beheld God, and they ate and drank. Any ideas?
who are they eating and drinking with or in the presence of? I believe the easiest and best way to understand this is that they are in the presence of the pre-incarnate Christ. And we're going to see him show up in several places. But we'll get into that in our small groups. Anyways, so from that meeting, the elders go back down. Moses goes back up. And Moses spends chapters 25 through 31 speaking with God, getting very specific instructions on the tabernacle. Now, what is the tabernacle? That's the Holy of Holies is within the tabernacle. But really, what what are we looking at? This is a mobile temple. This is where... God is going to be worshipped. This is where Israel is going to come to worship him. Chapters 25 through 31 are giving us detailed descriptions of this. Why? It's not so that we build something like it, because this doesn't look anything like it, right? Why? Why? First and foremost, well, so what is the Holy of Holies? This is a throne room. This is where God sits as king. His presence is there, so it has to be. But, but why the detail? It's, it's not for us to replicate, unless we just want kind of a something to look at so we have some understanding. People have done that. They've tried to recreate it, not in some weird sense to worship there, but just, hey, from the best that we understand and can read this, this is what it might look like. That's interesting. We do not worship God the way we want to. God has already set the standards of how he will be worshipped. It's not for us to decide, I think we ought to worship him this way. He is a God of precision. He is a holy God. You come to him on his terms, not yours. And when we get to Leviticus, we'll read about a couple of guys who decided to dare God on that. Anyways, then we get to chapter 32. What's chapter 32? Full scale rebellion. We might have said this before, but rebellion and sin are ridiculously illogical. Sin is illogical. Why on earth? Would the people just get tired after 40 days? You've spent 400 years in servitude. God has freed you from that. It is clear that Moses is his prophet. Really? You're going to make a calf and Aaron's the one doing it? Behold, Israel, your God? Are you kidding me? We can just go through and just start ticking off all the different commandments that they are breaking and remember the purpose of these this is how one acts this is how one lives in light of a holy god they do not consider him holy they've made an idol they made another god they've taken his name in vain wouldn't surprise me at all to find out that this happened on a saturday and they broke the sabbath too but we can only conjecture on that And so Moses comes down, and once again, what does Moses do in response to this? He breaks the tablets. Before he intercedes and after he breaks the tablets. Why did he give them to the people? That's a long, actually, no, that comes later. He leads a cleansing. 
he walks in anyone from Yahweh over here. And the whole tribe of Levi strapped on their swords and followed him. And they went back and forth through the camp and anyone still in rebellion. Moses was an instrument of judgment. And yet Moses was also a priest. God, you promised you can't wipe these people out. Who's that like? When Christ returns, what's he going to do? He's bringing judgment. But every last one of his people, Father, they're mine. Interesting. Interesting. Chapter 33 is interesting because God stays his hand, but he is not happy. He's like, all right, get up, get out of here. I'm not even sure I want to be associated with you guys, but I'm going to let you live anyways. And Moses goes before God and he says, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. This is a fruitless, pointless endeavor if you're not with us. Now, he's not arguing with God. He's not trying to change his mind. But God is allowing Moses to go through this so that we have a record of this conversation. So, yeah, if God's not in it, it ain't going to happen. But God is a God of promises, and he is a promise keeper. And so, of course, he is going to go with them. And what does Moses asked of God. At the end of this conversation, he really just explodes in praise and says, show me your glory. And this sets up chapter 34. God says, I'll show you my backsides because I don't want you to get fried. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock I'm going to put my hand on you, and when I walk by, you can see my backside. You can see my glory as I pass by. But he doesn't just pass by, does he? Yahweh introduces himself, proclaims something about himself as he is passing by. Look at chapter 4, verses or chapter 34, did I say 44? 34, verses 6 through 8. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindnesses for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, and yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low to the earth and worship. This is the first time in Scripture where God himself makes assertions about himself. We learn a lot about God via observation. He is a creator God, a God of order. We understand that by reading that he indeed created, and then we look at that creation, right? This is the first time in Scripture that God actually makes claims about himself. And what does he say about himself? He is compassionate. He is gracious, he is slow to anger. He is abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindnesses for thousands, forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, and yet there is justice. I'm gracious and compassionate, but I am also a just God. There is an entire theology proper right here. This is highly significant. You need to highlight these verses because 
previous or later writers of scripture are going to quote this at nauseum. This is the foundational block of what we know about God's character. Super, super important. And so, from this point on, construction continues or actually begins of this tabernacle that we've already received exact specifications for. And in verse or chapter 40, completion of the tabernacle is done. Towards the end of this book, there's another phrase that you need to hunt for and you need to underline and you need to highlight. Just as Yahweh commanded Moses did. Precise and complete obedience. How does the book of Exodus end? Look at verses 34 through 38 of chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But when the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of Yahweh was on their tabernacle by day and their fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Later on, we're going to get specifications of how they set up their camp. Got something like two million people. That needs organization. How's their camp set up? What's smack dab in the center? The tabernacle, right? Smack dab in the center of their camp. Who is taking up residence here? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Literally, God tabernacling with us. When Matthew is talking about the incarnate God in flesh, this is a reference. He's like, you think that was awesome? God dwelling in the midst of your camp? How about God literally dwelling among us? Oh, New Testament Christian, how about God dwelling within you? That just gives me goosebumps. Anyways, this is Exodus. I am so excited to, to read this, to, to study it with you guys. Let's see here. For this week, this coming week, starting tonight, I want you to go home and read the whole thing. Um, let's do chapters. Let's do chapters 1 through 15. Actually, no. Chapters 1 through 12. Chapters 1 through 12. We're going to just take that first uh, bullet point, Israel in, Israel in Egypt. Mike's shaking his head. Why are you shaking your head? It's a very inappropriately placed commercial break. Huh? Says who? Right before the Red Sea. If you would have got here on time. <laughs> Where he was here on time. Well, if you actually... There is no such thing as any commercial breaks. We should sit down and read all 40 chapters at once, but we got to break somewhere just for a uh, point of discussion. So we'll do chapters 1 through 12 this week. We'll discuss next week, um, and then we'll figure out what we're doing from there.